This is Conversations on Careers and Professional Life, a podcast from the Foster School of Business, MBA Career Management Office. I'm your host, Gregory Heller. On each episode, I talk with guests from faculty and staff to students and business leaders about the skills and strategies that can help you design a professional life that you're happy with. On this episode, I share two conversations with fellow career coaches in the Career Management Office, Elaine Knudsen and Stacy Duhan. We talk about informational interviews and offer advice for students on how to make the most of them. These conversations were recorded in December of 2019, before the pandemic struck. And while informational interviews, or coffee chats, are now taking place virtually, rather than in person over actual coffee, the advice my fellow coaches and I share still holds true. I hope you enjoy these conversations on careers and professional life. I'm here in the studio, Studio K, with Elaine Newton, and we are here to talk about informational interviews. And, and some people may also call this, Gregory, networking. Or the expert interview. <laughs> That's true, yeah. Or a prototyping conversation. But yeah, so we want to keep an open mind here when we say informational interviews. Yes, it goes by many names. And it's a really important part of getting a job. It is. I think it's important from, let's think of all the elements that make it important. One is it's fact finding and data gathering, right? Absolutely. Two is all the great little nuggets that you can get, right, from those conversations and then use in interviewing and your resume and cover letters and all of your collateral, right, and external branding. Yeah, it's about getting that insider insights from people who actually work in a job at the company. Right. Or at the company and not in the job, right? Or who've worked in the job at other companies. And one thing that I feel really passionate about is we have to be thinking about the long-term impact of investing in informational interviewing, right? For me, one of the most overlooked aspects of informational interviewing is this is building your community, your professional community. I like to talk about professional wellness sometimes, and a big part of that for me is really having champions and having a community and building a place where you can go and converse and connect with people in ways that inspire you, right, and push you to be better. So I think that's like the biggest, highest level um, perspective of informational interviewing, but it's important. So should people be trying to become best friends with every person that they have an informational interview with? Good question. I mean, I think that sounds exhausting, Gregory. (laughs) (laughs) And I think you're going to find that there's very few people that you have a really unique connection with. But when you do, I'm going to go back to that point I just made. Those are probably the people that you want to continue to invest, right, in in making sure that you're giving them something. You're not just taking something from them. Um, So that's probably part of your data gathering, right, is like sussing that out as you're building relationships. So there's a numbers game, though, because if you're not going to have that connection with every person that you have an informational interview with, then you have to have a lot of informational interviews so that you can find the few that become that extended professional network that you're trying to build. True. But with one caveat, Gregory, we have to think about being our best selves and intentionally picking the people that we want to talk to. Because if we have even an inkling that we may be talking to someone who doesn't want to talk to us, they're doing it maybe because they have to, or there's any kind of stickiness there, you might want to think about how that it, it could there be any negative in, implications of me having this conversation I think is another thing to think about and those can come from a variety of reasons one is I just said you know I gave one example second example is you know you did it too soon you reached out too soon you're not prepared you don't know what to ask them about you don't know how to engage them and then that's kind of your reputation and that's all they know about you too right so while it's a numbers game you also want to be strategic i think and i like to focus on quality over quantity in some cases until i feel really comfortable and then right. i usually up the numbers from there i mean i'm not much of a sports person but i'll use a baseball analogy i guess right it's like you're up at bat yeah you have to swing in order to hit the ball, but you can't swing at every pitch, right? So you have to be discerning about who you uh, select to ask to do an informational interview. 
with. And when you do that, it's sort of like, what's the count? You know, agreed. That that's the timing piece of it, right? Right. There's depending on where you are in your career search or where you are in your uh, research on a company, you might be more or less prepared to have that conversation. Well, does that mean, Gregory, that we can't do anything when we're not yet prepared, or do you think there can be layers and levels to who we reach out to? I absolutely think that there are layers and levels. Right. Let's think about how we could build some strategies or talk about it, right? Yeah. How have you seen students execute um, well on that exact strategy we're talking about, the layers and the levels and who to engage when? Yeah. Well, I think the first part is doing, you know, the, there's research involved, right? So there's research on the company that you're targeting, and then there's research on the people at that company. Mm-hmm. And I think that a great and natural place for uh, first-year MBA students at the Foster School of Business to start is with second-year MBA students at the Foster School of Business or evening MBA students at the Foster School of Business who have a connection to that company either through an internship or a uh, independent study or field study project that can get them some of that foundational information that they can't get through Google. Fair. Right? No, I think that's a really good point. I like to think of it. I don't have a good analogy, Gregory. Boy, you got me there. <laughs> but I like to think of it as safety levels, right, and risk. So what is the level of risk or how safe is the conversation at, you know, the second-year level, someone who's still in school? Then I think about the next level, which is someone who's one year out of their MBA. And then you kind of go up for there, right? And so there's, like, more risk and more reward the higher that you go. But you also have to ensure, like, in to make sure those are safe conversations with a level of preparedness. So I think that's a good way to kind of segment your research that you're talking about. And I love using a spreadsheet to do this. So I have some. Tell me about your spreadsheet. I love to tell you about my spreadsheet. So I have something called a networking spreadsheet. I use one for myself, and I've also shared it with folks that I work with. And you it's haven't a, shared it with me. Sorry, Gregory. You have to make an appointment. Mm. You, what you can do is kind of have multiple tabs in a spreadsheet. And this can be whatever you want it to be. For me, I have my first tab, which is people that I know I want to engage, but I'm not ready to reach out to them yet. But I don't want to lose sight of why I wanted to talk to them, right? We go to networking events. We go to conferences. You talked about having a connection with someone. This happens to me all the time because when it's right, it's right. And I think, gosh, that's someone who I should really engage in my network. And then six months pass because I get busy and I forget their name. And I can't find them again on LinkedIn. So I that tab for me is all the kind of to-do and the exploratory and the ideation. And then the second tab is um, – used when I actually reach out to the person and so I can kind of like write down do they write back or how did that go and then my third tab is actually um, or by the way you can have this all segmented in the same spreadsheet and just make sure you have a column right to filter the level Uh, those are conversations that I've had and so when I work in a coaching engagement what I love about having a spreadsheet for networking conversations that you've had is we can sort that by company name and we can really look for themes. And what I'm looking for is not necessarily all the details from the journal you may have had for that conversation. I'm looking for visceral reactions to the conversation, consistent words the person kept using that are maybe tied to the culture, things like that. And then we can use those in some of our collateral. When you say collateral, are you talking about resumes, cover letters, things of that nature? I sure am. And I think in some cases it might even be on LinkedIn, right? If you're really targeting something specific, let's say you had 10 different conversations with product managers in tech, but there were some really consistent themes. You know, I would feel really confident in drawing a story from those themes and putting it in my summary. The summary on LinkedIn. Yes, thank you. Yeah, yeah summary on LinkedIn. Okay, yeah. excellent. And then let's talk about that sort of next stage like when do you know that you're ready to Mm -hmm. go to that next level of risk with the informational interviews right the let's say the Mm -hmm. one to three year (laughs) out MBA at a company I think a great indicator of that is when someone offers 
to either refer you to someone else or recommends you talk to someone else. I think that's a great indicator that you came prepared, you brought your best self, and they saw something and they have faith in you, right, to put their name on that recommendation, which brings up a really important point I'd love your perspective on, Gregory. When you meet someone for the first time, should you ask them to refer you to a job? I would say no. No, I would also say no on that. I think it's a little too soon. Yeah. What do you think? Survey says no. Yeah. So that's one question that we get all the time from our students. You know, I think there's this perception with informational interviewing and the intensity that you have to do it at the MBA level while you're in the program. There, there's this perception it's a numbers game, right? And you have to check boxes of having conversations with so many people. And maybe that will be why you get an interview. And I think it's a misperception. I feel very confident. I've heard from our alums it's a misperception. It's more about having quality conversation with purpose and intention, right? That, that you show that you're well prepared and you want to give back in the same way that you're receiving, right, from that connection. And so I would say unless – the person offers I would definitely not ask in that first conversation you know unless it's it's just so obvious that they want to do it what are some other questions that you would avoid in a first informational interview conversation with someone I would not ask any questions that you could find the answer on the website I know that sounds obvious but I, you know, take informational interviews as well and I can't tell you how often some of those basics come out um, and if it's because of nerves, make sure you do a practice, quote, interview with a coach or a friend before you meet with a person so that does not come out. I think you definitely don't want to use just generic. So I've seen online there's like a top five questions asked in an interview, you know, in an informational interview that may be something like, you know, tell me about your job. What do you do? And so I think the second thing is making sure there's a leader into that question of like, I understand like showing that you did your homework I understand you're in this role and it sounds like your group is doing this I'd love to learn more about how you're thinking about this next industry challenge so it's a little bit more thoughtful what other questions I don't know what would you add to the list Gregory well I wouldn't ask anything about salary oh good point yeah that's getting pretty personal on the first date right yeah (laughs) the same with asking for them to refer you yeah I think that's a tough one, and I know why some students will ask it, but it is a little off-putting for the interviewee. You know, I think a big part of the informational interview is to not seem like you're there looking for a job Mm -hmm. from that person because then they see you as a job seeker and they judge you as a candidate Mm -hmm. rather than as someone who is looking to learn about what they do or what their company does. Good point, Gregory. And in that lens, have you ever heard of times where people turn the informational interview into an actual interview? I have heard that happen. Me too. Right? And it doesn't happen because the interview, the interviewer, the student who has requested the informational interview, you're not the one who can turn it into a job interview. By showing your preparedness, by your thoughtfulness, the kinds of questions you ask, it can turn that way because now the subject of the interview, the, the person who you are talking to, starts to see, wow, this is someone who is really sharp. Right, And right. I actually could use someone like this on this project that yeah. I'm working on. And full disclosure, I won't give any names out, I've also seen it go in another direction. So I've had folks disclose to me that – you know, they've met with students who are maybe not so prepared for the interview. And so, you know, because they asked questions like salary and will you refer me and some things that maybe were a little more off-putting, they decided to turn it more into an interview to kind of get a sense of like, you know, why are you here and questioning that. So, so there's two sides to that coin. And I think the point of being prepared will cover you in either scenario. Absolutely. So be prepared. Show up curious with good questions, but not like a clipboard survey of questions (laughs) that you're looking to answer because it is a conversation. Yeah, I totally agree. And here's some other tips that I would give. Less is more. You know, I would go into the conversation. You hopefully 
are prompting someone to pay attention and notice you, right? And and hopefully you come across as likable. So in theory, this is not our only conversation. If you go in with a few agenda items in your head or you have like one clear goal to get out of the conversation, it just makes it that much easier for the other person. We've asked for their time. So I think honoring that and being very respectful of, you know, Say, acknowledging how busy they are and how grateful you are that they were willing to meet with you and you can do that in ways before you even see them. One example I like to give is try giving wide ranges of options that you can make yourself 100% available so it's most convenient for them. Right. You don't want to say, I can meet with you at 930 on Friday morning. Right. And it's Thursday, you know, so but sometimes those things happen. That's a good point. Yeah. So giving a a range of options, confirming with the person a day or two in (laughs) advance to make sure that it's still okay. When you sit down for the interview, double checking whether they have any hard time constraints so that you can be mindful of their time right there. That's such a good point. I always love when people email me the night before right to say hey I'm really looking forward to meeting and reconfirming here's the location the time if anything comes up a lot of times people will say here's my cell phone you can always text me and so um, I think that that usually goes over really well so let's talk about one more thing before we end this interview how do you end (laughs) how do you end an informational interview if it's not with asking for the referral to the job right what are some good ways to end that interview um, well, I let me think of a couple things. I think one way to end an interview really well is to recap on maybe one or two items that were incredibly helpful or insightful to you during the conversation. So thank you so much for meeting with me. Here are some of my key takeaways, and these are some next steps that I'm going to take. The reason why I like that is it makes me feel like if I'm the person that was asked, right, to do an informational interviewer, my time was really efficient. You got something out of it. And I think I feel um, um, really good about that. The second thing is you'll have to suss out and use your judgment. But sometimes at the end of the conversation, you can give a very specific agenda item of like a next step. So if it was a great conversation, there was a strong connection, you almost kind of ask permission. I would love to connect with you again when I get to my second quarter and I took that class that you were talking about. Would that be okay? And so it's a way to kind of re-engage them and you leave something, a door open. Um, Of course, gratitude, a handwritten thank you note after the fact, I think is always a great way to show someone that you really appreciated their time as well. What else would you add to that last, Well, the the question that is on my mind, because I hear students ask about it and I wanted to get your opinion, is, is there anyone else you think I should speak with? I think that's a great question. I usually recommend doing that, but... I think you have to use judgment. You have to know that the conversation went well before you ask that question. Because I I really have found, even for myself, um, some people are very conservative and kind of giving out other people's names and and, um, email addresses. And I also found that some people like to ask that person permission before doing that. So I think that's a great point. Are there other, are there other ways you could reframe that? Are there other ways you could ask that question? You know, where you say, "Hey, give it some thought," but I would love to talk to some other people that are in this 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 department. You know, would it be okay if you, I reach out to you tomorrow and get some addition? You know, so decide. You can put them on the spot at the moment. You know, if they're offering to do that, for sure ask. Um, but if you're sensing some hesitation, honor it. Yeah, like reframe it. With, reframe with, it. I like the way you, yeah. you put it. What I was thinking was, you know, if there's anyone else you think would be really helpful for me to speak with, yes. you know, and, and you think of them later, you can just drop, drop me. Yeah, email, I'll right? check in with or you. I'll, yeah, I'll check I'll back check, in I'll a week check, or so. check back in with you. I think that's good because then you're still, don't give them anything to manage, right? Right. Yeah. Great conversation, Gregory. Yeah, I think we got some helpful tips here. So thanks for coming in and uh, having a conversation on careers and professional life. As always, it's my pleasure. Talk soon. Now let's hear part of my conversation with Stacy Duhon. What are some of those questions that you think really get at that? Just to give people a sense, a taste of what are some 
Good questions. One of the things that we recommend is that you only ask for 15 or 20 minutes. These folks are really busy. So let's just say you only had 15 minutes. Here's a couple main questions you might ask. If I was saying interested in a, being a McKinsey consultant, I might, my very first question, just to start out with, I'd love to hear a little about your career path and how you ended up here. Like that's the question that only that person can answer. And it's a nice warm up question. And then you might ask, as someone who wants to be a McKinsey consultant, what advice do you have for me, right? Because they know they're a McKinsey consultant and they can tell me. And then to wrap it up, you might just ask who, now this question you would use your judgment in asking if you've made a good relationship and a good rapport with them, but you might ask who else do you think would be a good person to speak with about working at McKinsey? So in the limited time, those three questions. You definitely want other questions to have ready just in case you have time, but those are good starters. One of the questions that I like to suggest is uh, something along the lines of, what is it about this job that you love? Mm -hmm. Right? Because again, it gets people talking about their own personal experience. Mm -hmm. Nice. Yeah. You know, or what about this company? Do you, you love? love? Or, you know, I see that you've worked at these three companies. Mm -hmm. How would you differentiate the culture between them? Oh, that's a really good one. Yeah. Right. Absolutely. They get them comparing from their own experience. Absolutely. Well, and you could also ask them a question about what, what are the biggest problems your company faces now? And so that they can be talking about things that they know well. And also a question like that will help you know, let's just say you do get an interview, then you understand better what some of the biggest things this company is facing. And you can make sure and put that in your messaging in the interview process. Right. How do you see this industry changing mm. in the next two to five years? Mm -hmm. What are the most important characteristics of success in this company or in this role? Yeah. Yeah, yeah. I like that one a lot. I've, I've suggested what are the traits that lead to people being successful at this company? Yeah, that's a really good one. Yeah. Great. So these are some great questions that you can ask once you're in an interview. When you finish, when you conclude the interview, how do you wrap it up? What's the next steps? Um, the follow-up to after the informational interview. Um, we highly recommend, it is actually a must, that you at least reach out and thank the person that you have interviewed with. Um, it can be an email, but even an extra touch would be a nice personal note that you write and, and mail them the old-fashioned way. And then what we also recommend, if you're not already on LinkedIn with this person, which you probably are, that's probably how you reached out, but let's just say you found them a different way, make sure you connect on LinkedIn. We've heard from uh, past alumni that, hey, people have done informational interviews with us and they've never even connected with me on LinkedIn, right? So it's just, it's the next thing to do. And then what we also invite um, or recommend to the students, look, not every person you do an informational interview with is going to be a connection for you. Like you maybe you didn't resonate as well or you didn't create, it's all about relationship building. But for those that you did create um, a nice basis of a relationship with, you'll want to stay connected with them on LinkedIn. If they get a promotion or they write an article or they post something, make sure you're reaching out and um, responding to these posts. Um, the other thing that's real important, if this person has provided you some information, recommended a book to read or recommended someone that else you should talk to or some practices you should take on, if you've done that, make sure and loop back with them and let them know what you got out of doing that. And then the last thing is when you, when you do land, hey, reach back out to them and let them know where you ended up. Right. I think those last two pieces, I, I mean, obviously the thank you note, I feel like goes without saying, but we need to underscore it. Send that. But the last two pieces of the follow-up, students will often ask, well, how, what's the cadence? How often mm -hmm. should I be reaching out to this person? And I give similar advice. If you had a really strong connection with them, then update them when things change for you. But dropping a note to someone when something that they told you becomes valuable, right, is a great way to show gratitude for the time they spent with you and the advice they gave you. Mm -hmm. Oh, I read that book and it really changed my thinking about mm -hmm. this topic, the industry, whatever it is. Mm -hmm. And I know one of the things that I do often after I meet people in networking settings is when I come across something that relates to whatever we talked about mm -hmm. or the business they're in that I think they might not see because I'm looking at different news and information and things that I have access to because I'm here at the university, I'll drop them a quick note and mm -hmm. say, hey, I saw this article 
And it reminded me of our conversation. And if you haven't seen it yet, I thought you might find it interesting. Well, the reason that that is such a great tip or a practice to do is that, remember, it's a relationship building interaction. Networking isn't just transactional. So if you do see something that they might like or that might support them in what they're up to, um, you giving back to them is so very important. Thank you, Stacey Duhon. You're welcome. It was nice to be here. The key takeaways to remember about informational interviewing are that you must respect the time of the person you're talking with. Do your research, come prepared, and be curious. Be professional. From the first outreach to the way you follow up with a thank you note and then any later updates or follow-ups. This is your opportunity to demonstrate your professionalism. You're not going to become friends with every person that you have an informational interview with, but do keep an eye out for those with whom you have a strong connection and look for ways to strengthen and build that relationship over time. Be strategic about who you ask for an interview and when you make that ask. Don't overdo it at a single company. Merely having informationals is not likely to correlate directly with getting the internship or job interview. Always take good notes and use what you learn when you're recruiting for positions. Thank you for listening to another episode of Conversations on Careers and Professional Life. I'd love to hear what you think about the podcast. You can email me at gheller at uw.edu. And if you've enjoyed this episode, please share it with a friend or classmate. We can always edit it. Yeah, we always toss it out.